So this is probably among the weirdest talks I've ever done. So <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> um, now I'll try to knock, to knock everything off of my stand here. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I have some paper and pens that Patty has graciously uh, <laughs> been voluntold to distribute. And then also um, some poems. And I, I'm not sure I made enough copies. <clears throat> okay, yeah, we can share. I mean, yeah. And um, there's also some little pieces of paper here. Okay, great. Yeah. Because there's a class assignment. It'll be fun. All right. It was kind of an amazing opening and just, you know, I forget, you know, the Heart Sutra, how much poetry is in our prayers, right? It's like, it's all poetry. It's so beautiful. And today I'm bringing some different poems because sometimes I think if we say the same poems over and over again, we start to say them by rote and they kind of can lose their meaning. So uh, I'll switch it up a little bit. I thought about doing a kind of like, let's look at the Heart Sutra again. But, you know, we look at it all the time. I think let's look at something fresh. Maybe we'll have some different insights or it'll strike us in a different way. Um, so today, you know, we'll talk a little bit about poetry. And um, let me tell you, this is, we're, we're taking a fun and lighthearted approach today. This is, we're not doing deep scholarship here. Um, yeah. So um, let's just kick off. Let's warm up and do a little bit of a throat clearing. And um, on the second page of your handouts, uh, there's a poem called Seeding an Alphabet. And I'll read this one, but then another one later on, I'll ask somebody else to read. So on page two of the three-page handout, and it's called Seeding an Alphabet by an American poet and one of the founding editors of the Poetry Foundation. And it goes like this. I'll read it out loud, yeah. To invent the alif bite, decipher the grammar of crows, read a tangle of bare branches with vowels of the last leaves, scrawling their jittery speech on the sky's pale page. Choose a beginning. See what God yields in dirt seeds, when tines disturb fescue, vetch, and sage, when your hand dips grain from a sack, scattering it among engraved furrows, beyond the hill a plume of dust, where oxen track the hours. Does God lead, or follow, or scout? To answer, count to one, again and again. A red maple leaf and a yellow maple leaf. That wind rifles and rain shines until they let go, blazing their scripted nothingness on air. So as an opening, I just wanna say thank you very much for being here because without you, literally, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I don't know whether to thank you or curse you, but it seems kind of funny and obvious that without you, I really don't have any reason to be here or to speak about this today. So this is a nice intro to this because we're really creating this moment together. And yet at home, even though you weren't physically with me, you were in my thoughts and in my heart for the past two weeks. You were exhausting to say the least. And that made me think about many things. You know, some of you I don't know here very well, and some of you I haven't met, and some of you I call friends. Yet each and every one of you have shaped and are continuing to shape this moment with me in this strange play, this dance of energy. We're seen and unseen. We come together and we pull apart. Our bodies, our minds, and our tongues touch and go across time and space. I told you it was going to be weird today. 
but I could find no other way to talk about this. So today I've been asked to talk a little bit about Buddhism and language, and I'm definitely a beginner on the path. I'm also not a scholar, nor am I trained in linguistics. By nature, I'd much rather work with color and composition than crush the plants and the rock to extract the minerals and pigments. And though I understand the need for both to cr produce a creative work, today's talk is more of an exploration, more art than science. Um, I also confess straight away that I've never been very interested in literary criticism. I was sort of forced to take a class and I dropped it. Um, even, you know, I do, I do have a, you know, a master's in English, so I was forced to take some of it, but it's, it's um, <clears throat> it, to me, it killed the living word, right? It was like a, if an entomologist had put a pen, a pin through a butterfly. So that's my bias. So, um, because I see language even in its most basic form as an act of faith, a kind of a communion or transmission of its own. So, lucky you, no Lacan or Derrida or Wittgenstein today, or Nagarjuna or Chandrakirti. So, just the beauty and power of language to shake us out of our habitual patterns of thinking. So, let's talk a little bit about what is the function of language from without, and I promise it won't be as boring as that sounds. Um, how does language work or how doesn't it work from the 50,000 foot level? So language is something most of us use all the time, but we rarely think about, unless or until we have an urgent need to consider our word, words carefully, like when we're in an argument with a loved one, or when you want to convince something, someone to do something for you that they really don't want to do. Or when you suddenly realize that you use the wrong word or phrase and the person you're talking to takes offense and thinks you meant something other than what you did and your meaning has been lost completely. And now not only do you have to say it in the right way, but you have to convince them that the original way that you said it was wrong and you didn't intend it to be that way at all. And that's a lot of language that has to wrap around that mess. So language pulls us together, but it also creates divides. Right. Um, so there are times when it suddenly feels like language is a dangerous weapon or cumbersome, and we trip over our words and start slipping down the side of a hill, and our words are like shale, right? And they're just like they're just tumbling and falling out from under us. And uh, these are times when we see the value of slowing down in our speech and being careful with our words. But we're so familiar with the way that we talk. It's so comfortable. It's so easy that we just like rapid fire. So today, um, you know, this is more like, you know, kind of a what's the value in slowing down? So for most of the part, our day-to-day -day language um, feels pretty easy and unconscious. It comes naturally. And we speak in ways that tend to be really concrete and practical utilitarian. Our daily language is a workhorse. It's the PC in the computer world. We're out of coffee, car payments due, Michelle Obama's pure fire. You know, sort of, we like these declarative statements. So it follows, also the language follows a fairly um, limited number of sentence patterns. And we like shorter declarative statements that convey information or ideas and express our opinions. Our language is functional, it has a job to do. We employ it to accomplish goals, informing, entertaining, explaining, persuading, comparing, blaming, <laughs> all kinds of things. But language also seeks to describe or make us make sense of our experience, both inside of our heads and outside in the world. And the more we use it in certain ways, telling ourselves certain things over and over again, the more it reinforces our perception of the world and our position to things. So the way we use language reflects our culture, our values, our worldview, and our biases, and it reinforces our reality. We label things. Labeling is power. It's how we know the world. This is a dog. This is a tree. When I say dog or tree, an image immediately springs to mind, right? Let's start with dog. I've got my image. It's weird. It's a cartoon. 
It's like a kid's drawing of a dog. Do you have one? Really? Look, what's your what's your generic image of a dog? Big brown legs and a tail. Yeah. Uh, and a flop, probably. Anybody else? Yeah. And that's your generic for a dog? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Memory of a dog. Yeah. It's funny, you know, so we've got this sort of universal idea of dog, but yet we all picture something different, something that's personal to us. And yet it's impersonal because it won't have necessarily, unless you're Susan, a name <laughs> or a collar or be probably a particular breed, chances are. And of course, there's no such thing as a generic dog. So these universals are shorthand that let us communicate quickly, but they're also a fiction, but a fiction that we all agree to and create together. The opposite of this universal would be a specific dog. And we're going to talk a few minutes about Rufus. He's my chihuahua. So we could describe Rufus in some very specific ways, from his name to his physical attributes to his personal character and behavior. If you like the singer Rufus Rain Wainwright, you probably think it's a pretty cool name. But oftentimes I'll say it and people kind of go, what? Is that Scottish or hag haggis? <laughs> um, or it rhymes with doofus. So there's that. So it could be a stupid name. But Rufus is a, he's a small dog, but is he? Compared to a Great Dane, he's snack size. And both are right, right? I mean, if you look at a Great Dane, Rufus is small. But if you look at a teacup poodle, Rufus is kind of big. If you like small, energetic dogs, he's totally charming and he's going to work the room. But if that's not your cup of tea, then he's a yappy nuisance. And that he leaves hair everywhere, so insult to injury. And both are, would be right. So the closer we look at Rufus, <clears throat> the more he changes. Because of our own filters and biases, because of the day, the time, the circumstances that are, we meet him, because of our own thoughts and expectations, about meeting him or being in front of this dog. And then the dog's going to have a reaction to that as well. So, so there can be a reinforcing loop, again, with our expectations and ideas and the way that we describe things and think of things, our ideas. Or maybe it's more like physics. It's like uh, Rufus is the new Schrodinger's cat. Whatever you expect to see him, whatever you expect out of him, he delivers. So this is a kind of a silly example to show that language is a little weird and slippery. On the one hand, it works really well, and we, so well, in fact, that we can be fooled into thinking that these words, labels, ideas, and things that we talk about are real and solid out there. But when we look closely, they kind of slip through our hands. The Buddhist scholar Jose Cabazon writes, words do have reference, but these reference have substance to them, being themselves have no substance to them, being themselves merely labeled entities that depend on other entities, and so on ad infinitum. Every entity depends on other entities in a giant web where the only reality is the interrelatedness of the entities. If any of you remember uh, the visual thesaurus online, it's kind of funny, This is it reminded me of that. You type in a word and it would bring up in a visual form these little circles of synonyms. And every time you clicked on one, five more would come up. And you click on what's, well, what does that mean? And five more would come up. And when you start to sort of break language down into units, like, you know, what is, how would you describe this particular characteristic or a color? And suddenly, it's like, well, it's, this color is not these colors. 
and, but it's also within like green. There are five thousand, you know, variations of green that happen, and then it just starts to disappear. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Dog, Chihuahua, Ponchi, blonde, all things not blonde, all variations of blonde. How specific can we get? I'm talking again about my dog. And what is it that makes Rufus really any different from any other dog? Is it his legs, his underbite? So cute. His curled tail? It's not his insides. His heart and lungs have no defining characteristics that belong just to him, but they're housed in this body that we call Rufus. So can we get to an indivisible dog called Rufus? I don't think so. And yet he's at home listening to this talk right now. <laughs> Appearing and disappearing. Another scholar commented that language is indispensable for turning private experience into something communicable and hence possible to share with others. And that seen in this way, he says, language offers the possibility for transcending the limitations of perception and attaining a kind of intersubjective and socially shared validity. The way I read that is that we're making meaning together. It's a shared experience that is real to us who are here together right now in this moment, but it doesn't exist anywhere else and in any solid way. So um, there's... It's kind of a funny saying. It's it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. I think that was in the foyer for a while. It was like monks sitting around. <laughs> uh, so Rufus doesn't care about any of this, but we do. You know, it's fun to take him apart and put him back together. He's a dog. He's fun to play with. But it's a lot less fun when we think about the implications for ourselves. And if we're really doing the practice, we're going to be reaching this uncomfortable moment where we're looking at the illusory nature of ourself, ourselves and our identity. <clears throat> where we're confronted with our dualistic thinking of self and perceiver, objects and receivers and separate things. And this is the definition of suffering. Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, he's an author and a, a lama in the Bon tradition, and he says, anybody interested in spirituality and in personal development and ultimate liberation and enlightenment is interested in overcoming the pain of our identity and conditioned existence. We're committed to understand, overcome, and realize that true liberation only comes from self-realization, not the recognition of a projected self. He also says, anytime you think you are someone, you've blocked the possibility of all the things you could be. So it's better to be no one because then we can be anyone. Kind of as we close the talk, we're gonna he he wrote this poem called Who Am I? and has recorded it on YouTube and we'll watch it. It's a it's it's long, but it's rich and um and I think you'll enjoy it. It's quite beautiful. So thinking about language and its implications is hard work, and maybe our heads hurt a little bit. There's a kind of intellectual understanding that happens, but it's vague and it's still mired in conceptual thought versus that sort of known feltness or recognition like grasp of insight. And I've had to use a lot of words in the last few minutes to get to this idea that language exists but is empty of inherent meaning or existence. Language describes situations and things that are also real but empty, lacking inherent essence that could hold up their being independent from something else. like a finger, right? It exists on this relative level and it does these things, but it's also part of a hand. So this helps define it, but it's part of something larger. Um, so language, why? So this lacking inherent essence, and this is because language comes from the mind and expresses this is this is just me talking. I'm not citing like, but if you think about it, the language comes from the mind and expresses the nature of mind itself, which is also real and empty as well. And all of this reflects the 
Madhyamaka view that all phenomena and everything we ascribe to them are ultimately empty. Everything owes its essence to something else in an interconnected web of dependent arising. So sometimes when we're talking and the language breaks down, what happens is that we're its, experiencing its limits, right? We see both the utility and the futility of, of language. The paradox of language is that it's often a both a vehicle and an obstacle to awakening. It enables us to read texts, listen to teachings, and this is powerful and potentially liberating. But at the same time, it's been noted by many Buddhist scholars that it's an obstacle because the dharma or the truth of how things are is beyond reach, beyond the reach of language and conceptuality. The dharma or the tao, the ineffable or suchness or thusness, whatever you call it, is something soundless, wordless, unnameable, inexpressible, beyond one thing or its opposite. Lama Jimpa says, Mahamudra, this union of perceived dualities, can't be taught. Dharma can't be grasped by the intellect alone through the study of scriptures. He writes, intellect is important as a pointer, not a realization. If you have a strong conceptual framework and you're really locked and loaded into it, I'm a terrible person, and by the way, the rest of you are as well, then you have all the incredible beneficial experiences, then, then you can have all of the incredible beneficial experiences, the ocean of Dharma could completely cover you, but if that rock-hard shell of terminal uniqueness is there, which is just based on concepts, it will never sink in. So if language fails, then why bother? Well, Rinpoche says, even so, even though maha mudra can't be taught, we want to at least point out the delusion. So we know which way to point if we really want to point at the moon. Alan Watts said, just as we have to stop talking to hear others, we have to stop talking to ourselves, our heads, our chatter in our heads, in order to see how things really are. And we do that on a cushion when we meditate, but practice can be hard, right? And we need instruction and guidance. We need to feel inspired also to keep going. The teacher gives us information and prayers, stories, poems, lojong slogans, any means necessary, throwing us a rope of woven words that helps pull us up the mountainous path. So we need to watch where we step, and listen closely, and we need to read and learn and make logical inferences. We need to recognize dualistic thoughts when they arise and discern delusion from truth. But we also need language to know what the goal is and what to expect. These are signs along the way. Otherwise, we have a general idea of where we're going, but no way to check out whether we're on track. We need signposts. How do we know if we're getting close? What should we expect when we get there? The Dzogchen teacher and writer Keith Dalman has written, how is this non-dual direct sensory experience verbally articulated? Evidently, it's not to be done in the manner of ignorant dualistic expression, but it has to be done with the same vocabulary and grammar. <clears throat> and that's, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> And that's where poetry comes in. It's the fast track. You can de deconstruct language all day long and give yourself a massive headache, but I'll take a poem over semiotics any day of the week. So let's read another poem and we'll warm ourselves up for our first assignment. Oh, I mean our only assignment. <laughs> okay. Class, please just take your hand out. Turn to page three. It's called Faith in Mind, and it's by Zen Master Sang Tsong. And I would like to ask somebody to read it. Oh, Patty, you have the microphone. The way is perfect, like great space, without lack, without excess. If the mind does not discriminate, all dharmas are of one suchness. The essence of one suchness is profound, unmoving, conditioned things are forgotten. Contemplate all dharmas as equal, and you return to things as they are. When the subject disappears, there can be no measuring or comparing. 
in the Dharma realm of true such, suchness, there is no other, no self. To accord with it is vitally important. Only refer to, only refer to, not to. In not to, all things are in unity. Nothing is excluded. The wise throughout the ten directions all enter this principle. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's shift and do something fun. You have a piece of paper, and hopefully you've got a pen. And what I'd like you to do is let your imagination just go and answer the question in a few sentences, or if you get on a tear, go for it. I'll put the timer on for uh, probably three minutes. What is emptiness? <laughs> you can do it. I can see some of you are going to throw the curve. All right, pencils down. <laughs> we'll come back and I'm going to ask you to share if you're comfortable sharing. It'd be fun. It's fun because I didn't do it. Um, so poetry is is kind of a it like it's like magic. It kind of slips past our conceptual thinking. It it sneaks in there. It's fast. It's it doesn't play by the rules. Unlike our everyday speech, poetry is largely unconcerned with utility or transactions or politics or marketing and selling. Major Jackson Jackson, who's an American poet and professor at Vanderbilt, says one of poetry's chief aims is to illumine the walls of mystery, the inscrutable, the unsayable. And Emily Warren, who you met earlier today, said, poetry binds solitudes. It enacts a central human paradox. We exist as singular selves, yet can only know them through our relations. And Keith Dahman describes the function of poetic language in his book, Flight of the Garuda, as this. The language of the path is structured with the intention to induce transcendence of itself, which is an aspect of the goal. So what makes a poem a poem? It's like porn. You know it when you see it or hear it. That sounds terrible. I'm sorry. 
I did not edit that one out. But anyway, poetry uses language in ways that makes us stop thinking. It breaks down the conceptual barriers and disrupts the lines of reasoning, like a sandal slap to the face that wakes us from, to the moment when we're stripped naked of our words and our understanding, and we are fully immersed in the experience of the moment. Poetry bends and breaks the rules of grammar, and it takes us past the limits of language and points out truths that we can't get to with our own logical and grasping minds. So we're forced out of, I know, I've read, I've seen, I've experienced, I've mapped this, I expect this into new realms, like how we saw the world when we were children, eyes and minds wide open like Guru Rinpoche's. This suchness or as isness of the moment is a way of experiencing reality versus a thing. And this is why so many of the classical textbooks and meditation manuals are written in verse and song. Poetry integrates the ultimate or absolute and conventional or relative. Matthew McMullen, a research fellow at Nansen Institute for Religion and Culture, says, navigating the fuzzy line between metaphor and reality is an essential component of religious thought and practice. Metaphors allow us to express the ineffable and explain the incomprehensible. Buddhism seizes on such metaphors not merely as abstract concepts, but as methods for crossing from the known to the unknown and ultimately for becoming a Buddha. And with that, I say, let's watch the video and then we'll share our own poems. I, who am I? I am no one. I can be anyone. I am Kunduzangpo, who cannot be seen by looking. I am the melody that cannot be heard by listening. I am the truth that cannot be learned by grasping. I am the energy that cannot be stopped by blocking. Do you know me? I am no one. I am the space between thoughts. I am the joy between painful moments. I am the confidence between fears. I am the peace between wars. Do you know me? I can be anyone. I am the light that sees the darkness. I am the air of compassion that hears the suffering. I am the warmth of the heart that generates joy. I am the power of the mind that benefits others. Do you know me? I am no one.
I am the expanse of the boundless sky. I am the radiant light that is everywhere. I am the wind that grants life force. I am the fire that enlivens the body. Do you know me? I can be anyone. I am the refuge that abides within you. I am the value that spontaneously manifests. I am the energy that arises naturally and ceaselessly. I am the activity that compassionately benefit others. Do you know me? I am no one. I am the mother who loves. I am the friend who can be trusted. I am the power that protects from enemies. Do you know me? I can be anyone. I am home for you who are homeless. I am a friend for you who are lonely. I am power for you who are weak. I am wealth for you who are poor. I am the mirror where you see yourself. Do you know me? I, who am I? I am no one. I can be anyone. Right. Um. Would anybody like to share? Yay. Okay, hold on, Lauren. Let's get you a microphone. Emptiness is the sound of wind blowing through the leaves of a tree. Beautiful. This will likely be the shortest one tonight. <laughs> one of two. Oh, nice. Shadow puppet dancing on the wall, seemingly manifest but ever ephemeral. Multi-layered conglomeration of myriad objects, hand, light, and shadow, magical display, interdependent illusions of just this, infinite potentiality dancing through the canvas of our life. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> you wrote that? For the wall. That's, that's amazing. It is for the wall. Yeah. I mean, all these are beautiful and that, uh, wow. Okay. 
now I feel I feel like I, well we'll come back more more this is beautiful everyone they're all so amazing I I read something but I please you must it's so I just think it's important to share <laughs> and disappearing interconnection with all that is everything included any others yeah good well this just came out it's i didn't even think about it Emptiness is not empty, but full of what we can't name or explain. It is one of nothing. It is everywhere where you can't point to it. All one or all none. The totality, a sphere of unlimited diameter. <laughs> wow. That's also for the wall. How do you... God, some competition, Dirk. Yeah, maybe I'm... Anybody else? He's wrapped up with that. I see. I uh, thank you for sharing. They're all beautiful, and I, I think one of the amazing things about poetry is that we just have permission to capture what we're thinking and feeling without having to follow rules and, and get kind of caught up in, in judgment and comparisons and so forth. And it is our own, you know, I mean, it's, it just, I don't know, start speaking the truth and adding to, to all of this moment right now. And, um, and I think you're all very brave for sharing and thank you. Um, and again, uh, I hope that this was fun, and um, I encourage everybody to to play with poetry and see where it takes you. And um, we do have a wall of poetry that um, you're welcome to type up your pieces and share. That'd be lovely. Maybe we could put a little book together or something of our poems. Yeah, I think... <laughs> That would be that would be great too. So all right, that's it. Thank you. For, thank you. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrizig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losam Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thank you, Jen. Oh, announcements. So, um, some of you here know, uh, um, in Actually, in, uh, next weekend, uh, there'll be a retreat with Lama Jimpa at Lotus View Ranch. And um, if you are interested in going, um, you can contact info at lionswarddharmacenter.org. 
um, it's something you have to request permission to go, but um, as many, we always want you to come if it's at all possible. So that's uh, next weekend, Saturday to Sunday. And then the other announcement I have is regarding um, Geshe Sewang of Nagari Institute is coming to uh, our center or coming to uh, we're coming up California on a major region. fundraising deadline, September and 6th. there aren't many and more between now and the election. Make a so I'm asking you to pitch in right this September 8th mm -hmm. and into November, but he's going to be at our center. Originally, it was September 15th, but now it's going to be September 24th. Excuse me. My apology. Thank you so much. October 24th, October 27th. So that's a very special time and we need lots of volunteers and there'll be more information coming regarding the Sand Mandela, which is so special. And many people outside of our center will probably come and we need help to take care of them and make them feel better. It's not the heavens, but I, that's why I can think of it. This Wednesday, um, Geshe Dam Chopra Jab, um, who's our resident monk, is going to start teaching us. He's already started, but he's going to continue a series on the foundations of awkward qualities by Lomas and Kappa. And uh, it's a really special teaching. He's very busy and he's taking time off to come and help us with that. So at six o'clock, he's going to be here um, to teach on the foundations of awkward qualities, followed by a meditation at seven o'clock. So everybody's welcome. Everybody, we're happy to see everyone in that show up and just come with a wide open mind and you know, like I mean, we're going to learn something. Wednesday at six, and then followed by meditation at seven. And if you're able to, to bring a teacher donation, that's okay. Everything's free. So just to secure the culture and the teacher help carry someone who's not able to let's do the next one. Oh, my God.